Hello, everyone, and welcome to the main stage. We are all building together a worldwide internet. It's easy for us to go virtually everywhere. Uh, probably most of us have brought a switch to a data center and installed it there by themselves. But have you ever shipped a switch to Sao Paulo? Today, Theo will present about exactly this. He's head of network engineering at Annexia and is running a global 100G network with over 90 pops serving 100,000 of customers with a team of less than 20 engineers. I'm happy to welcome Theo, the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, as said, my name is Theo, and thanks for having me today. In 2017, I joined Annexia, and when I came to Austria, I had only operated a European network. In the past three years, me and my team coordinated the upgrades of the majority of our POPs and added more to the list. Now, we have 90 POPs worldwide. Name a continent, I can give you a POP. Let me tell you, going global is not easy when you're only used to how things are done in Frankfurt and Amsterdam. We encountered plenty of hurdles along this way and sometimes had to find creative solutions to unexpected problems. Today, I want to highlight a few of these and give you some tips you can keep in mind when expanding your network. First, let's have a look at how things are done closer to home. Imagine Bob. He's a network engineer from Germany and wants to, wants to build a pop in Frankfurt. So Bob, of course, needs a data center and a provider. So first of all, he checks PeeringDB to choose suppliers and asks the community for advice and experiences. With the help of his friends, he makes a decision to choose data center A and data center and provider B. And next, he wants to see the place with his own eyes and schedules a tour at the data center to make sure that, he, that, that this is what he's really looking for. Of course, not in times of Corona. If he's satisfied with what he sees, he's asking for a quote and is soon able to sign a contract in German and he will pay his bills in euros. Bob's rack will be ready up on arrival as requested two weeks later, and he can ship his hardware using DPD, Deutsche Post, or whoever. If he needs a cross-connect or remote hands, he can simply use the portal and do this totally online. And if there's a hardware problem, Bob will drive down to the data center and change the disk himself. And a vendor technician can assist if needed. If Bob is enjoying his vacation on the beach and a router breaks down, he eventually might be able to get some help from the community for free. So when Bob gets a promotion and takes over the responsibility of his company's global network, he has no idea what he's into. This is the situation that I was in three years ago and that some of you might be in today. So I want to ask you, what do you think are the challenges of operating a global network or which challenges have you encountered if you have experience? I've prepared this poll, so please use the link on the top of the slide and to put down some of your thoughts. Let's see if this works. Okay, first one's here. Okay, let's wait another 30 seconds. It's already great to see how many how many ideas and concerns and uh, thoughts you have. Great. Thank you. It's, it's awesome to see what you have all come up with. Of course, I cannot cover all of these ones today, so I will pick a few of those I think are interesting to talk about. 
These are the topics I would like to cover today. And let's start with finding suppliers. The first step in building a pop outside of Europe is finding a data center and provider, of course, just like Bob did in Frankfurt earlier. However, finding those might be a bit more challenging if you're not in Europe. So let's take a look at the peering DB. Let's first search for Germany. In Germany, we will find hundreds of data centers and thousands of providers you can choose from. But let's take another example, Vietnam. Here we find only five data centers and five providers. Of course, there are dozens of others in the country, but most are not listed here or have never heard of PeeringDB. So what, would you, what should you do to choose a data center and provider then? Bob asked around in the community for advice, but do you have any context in Hanoi or Vietnam, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, sorry? Um, I certainly didn't. So here are a few things you can do. Attend large community events like Apricot, AfricaCom, or Nanoc to extend your net international network. Get over yourself, talk to people, and extend your comfort zone. Another thing you can do is talk to large regional IXPs. They have usually a good local community that might be able to help. And also research, research local NOCs and get in touch with them, even if you, know not, if you do not know anyone there yet. And once you've found a data center, you're usually faced with a decision. Do you go for a direct contract or a subcontractor? There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Many subcontractors have a more international focus and communication in English is easier. You're usually able to purchase in smaller quantities and they can help you with non-infrastructure related tasks like import, local purchases and translation, which can all be really important. However, organizing remote hands and cross connects might become a bottleneck with subcontractors. When it comes to regular visits, 24 seven support requirements, ordering higher quantities, a direct contact is more advantageous. So subcontractors are a good option if you're just getting started in a new market. However, when you're growing, reevaluate your priorities and make sure that all your needs are met. And at some point, it might be better to switch to a direct contract. But be aware that you're operating under foreign jurisdiction. You also might get a contract in Russian or Korean. And how can you evaluate that? In our experience, it's best to negotiate an English contract and make sure that this is the prevailing version. We had a situation where a supplier suddenly and prematurely ended the contract and wired our money back by PayPal. We weren't in a position where we could fight this legally and had to cave and look for new suppliers. These things can happen. Therefore, we usually make sure that we're never dependent on a single supplier or a single company in a country when we're dealing with critical infrastructure. When you have finally set up a contract now getting your first invoice, you might be faced with another big challenge you didn't anticipate. Your invoice might be in your rupees or UN and our bank cannot pay in rupees, can yours? This is another point where subcontractors might be advantageous. They are often able to receive payments in Euro or dollar so make sure to check this in advance so you're not getting in trouble when your first payment has to go through. Different countries also means different rules. This might also apply to licenses. Many countries require licenses and paperwork you have never heard of before. So you, know, you might need a license to speak BGP or offer internet access to customers. Figure out before you get started in a new market. Again, ask local communities for help and advice. In countries where we have experienced licensing issues, for example, with Russia, Turkey, Vietnam, or China. Different countries means also different standards. Data centers across the world obviously do not look all the same. So this is what a data center in Frankfurt looks like. You can see all the AC units on the roof, and I guess most of you would know which location this is. But would you expect this location to house a data center? A good sanity checking is using Google Earth or Google Street View to verify the location of the data center if you're dealing with locations outside of Europe. And this may sound trivial, but has helped us a lot to adjust our expectations. 
And if you want to make a visit to your data set at some point, and my colleague from Breeze can tell you stories about this, be aware that safety standards are not all the same. While in most European countries, you wouldn't even think twice about maintenance at night or driving across the city with expensive hardware in your trunk. This might simply not be a safe option in many other countries. Even taking a cab or a rental car at night might not be safe. Again, subcontractors can come in handy in these situations. And hiring local engineers that have experience with the safety situation might be a much better option for your company. So let's move on to the next point, and this is shipping. While shipping inside the European Union might be easy, shipments to and from the European Union must be exported and imported. Most companies told us that it's no problem to ship our hardware to Sao Paulo or Beijing, but ultimately all but two failed. Usually the import requires a local company that signs off the import. But if you do not have a local office and there's no tax ID or company registration number, that could be an issue. And after trying dozens of different companies, we found two ones, international ones, which we now use for all our shipments. They have offices all around the world and thus can thus be the importer of record for our hardware. And even if you have finally found such companies that can ship your hardware to your desired destination, there are plenty of problems that can pop up along the way. You're probably used to using a ticket ID for your shipments or your support tickets. But in many other countries around the world, these are not used at all. And people may have no idea what you're talking about. Additionally, you might be asked for numbers like EORI, HS numbers, EECN numbers, EIN numbers. And have you ever heard of those? We certainly hadn't before. Your hardware vendor will be able to help you with finding these numbers, of course. They contain information about export restrictions, taxes, or customs. In some countries, import, import taxes might be up to 100% of the value of your equipment, which makes even a single spare part or line cut super expensive. Often, you only find out about problems when your shipment is held up by local officials and missing paperwork is required. So did you ship everything in its original boxes? No? Well, that might be a problem. Also, be aware that when you're shipping hardware with the batteries, you may need to provide documentation about battery safety. This applies to almost every technical device, as even coin sales are counted as batteries. Your vendor can supply you with this information as well, but this can take several weeks or months, so contact them way in advance before you start, start your shipment. And trying to hide batteries, trust us, in the packaging is a bad idea because they will X-ray your shipment. And you don't, gonna, you don't want to get fined or your shipment held up because of a couple of coin sales. There are also other certificates that you might need for import. For example, PDUs might get confiscated by customs if they don't contain local electronic certificates. In this case, you might want to opt for buying at local vendors or from the data center itself instead of importing those from your home country. In general, it's a good idea to ask a shipment company what we'll need, will need for import into a specific country and plan plenty of time to gather all the required paperwork This brings us to my next topic, which is delivery of your rack. Because this is crucial in our experience. Always make sure that what you order is what you get. But how do you do this when you're halfway around the globe? We usually ask for detailed pictures and plan plenty of time for this. It seems that every single thing imaginable could be wrong. So I put together a few examples just to give you an impression. In this case, we ordered a single rack, usually part of a larger row, but we got this, a cage for one single rack, a rack without side panels, an empty patch panel hanging from the ceiling and way too far to be reached by the cables we shipped. Sometimes there are also interesting ways of mounting power distribution units or supplying redundant power supplies. And often, when we ordered racks that should be 80 by 120 centimeters, we got 60 by 100. So obviously, most of the power outlets in this example were blocked and couldn't be used. 
and even your understanding of REC security might differ substantially from your supplier's understanding. It takes days or weeks sometimes to get these things changed. And in many cases, the data centers even tried to charge us for what they had messed up. So again, the message here is allocating enough time is important and be super, super patient. So let's move on to cross connects and also a very important topic and where I've seen a lot of discussions recently. When you finally get your pop ready, you will want to auto cross connects. And while Bob and Frankfurt might just use an online portal and gets his cross connect delivered in less than 72 hours, outside of Europe and the US, you will usually not find such portals and lead times. We learned the hard way that there is no common standard and cross connect naming conventions might not apply everywhere. Again, inspect everything you order closely, ask for more pictures and make sure your patch panels fit your expectations. Sometimes you specifically have to say that you want a duplex fiber and not just a single fiber. And you have to be precise in your instructions. Make sure that you mention every single detail, even if you have to mention that you need to use a fiber cable to connect two fiber patch panels and not a copper cable. This reminds me sometimes of a Gadena to lightning or whatever adapter. And also central patch areas might be different from what you used in Frankfurt. And this can of course have a huge influence if you need someone to troubleshoot further down the line, if your light levels are bad or your port is down. So talk about, let's talk about operations because we did it. Our pop is set up, it's complete, it's running, great. Well, as you might think, uh, might expect from the theme of this presentation, the biggest challenge still lays ahead of us. And here, I cannot stress enough that clear communication is crucial. If you want something done outside of Europe by 2 p.m., you might want to emphasize again that this is 2 p.m. and not 4 p.m. And while you're probably used to a ticketing system, companies abroad might do their official support via other channels like WhatsApp, WeChat, or Skype, and might be harder to reach by email as you're used to. And did you ask for an escalation matrix? If something goes wrong in the middle of the night, be sure to have it available. Because having no technicians on site today is probably not an option for you in the midst of an outage. And once you want to deploy new hardware or change your infrastructure, you will make the use of remote hands. So I looked up the definition of remote hands in the internet and I found this one. Technicians who perform tasks on data on demand at a remote site, typically a data center. What I find quite funny about this definition is that task is not really defined at all. And this is also what we have seen in practice. So figure out what's meant by remote hands, smart hands, which sounds more prefer preferable to us, or hands and eyes, eyes would be great too, on field support. Sometimes pushing a button is covered, but inserting a new router spare part or NIC is not. Make sure that you know what type of support you can expect from your data center and when you can expect it. This way you might get sparred what we experienced when we had a technician tell us in the middle of the night that remote hands order must go through sales, who of course were all a sound sleep. Other times technicians started work without prior notice or they might not be able to work at all during the night for safety reasons. The message here is again, figure out what you can expect and again, communicate clearly with your suppliers before. So let's move on to the final part of this presentation because there are another few smaller topics I would like to touch upon, which I think are also very important. And the first one are new prefixes. And I guess all of you are used to this. Our customers open a ticket to tell us that they will soon announce a new prefix. And we then adjust our own filters and give our upstream providers a call to do so as well. This works pretty well in Europe. However, in some places, it can take the providers multiple weeks and requires a signed letter of authorization. Plan ahead and be aware that quick changes might not always be possible outside Europe. Ideally, include questions in, about lead times and reaction times 
well in advance in your initial discussion with your providers. The next topic I would like to cover are spare parts. When a part breaks down, which happens, I guess, every day, we're used to either ask the tech or shipping a spare part directly to the data center using same day delivery and letting then remote hands do the job. However, some suppliers do not deliver remote to remote places and not all the countries we are operating in have Amazon Prime available. It's important to let your supplier know as well that your equipment has been shipped to Sao Paulo as conditions for support may differ in Brazil from those in Germany. In our experience, it's important to include enough spare parts in your shipments and think about where you could source locally just in case. And always adjust your expectations to the situation in each country you're operating. While reports of abuse of IP addresses might not usually send you over the edge in Europe, you should pay really close attention to them when they come from abroad. In places where you're not protected by European laws, you can soon have a couple of police officers marching into your data center and seizing your servers. And it's not always obvious if these emails are legitimate or fake. Take this one, for example. I don't know how many of you speak Korean, but nobody in my team does. So Google Translate it is. Should we upload a virtual machine to a shady looking FTP server or is it all fake? It's not always easy to tell this and you have to evaluate this on a case by case basis very carefully. In this case, we contacted our local embassy to help us clarify if this email was legitimate. But I would be really curious to know or to hear what you would have done in this situation. Finally, Every device will reach the end of its lifetime eventually and needs to be dismantled. And since you can't always drive there and collect your old hardware, and re-import can be extremely expensive from some countries, you can look for help from your local partners or the data center to assist you with the removal. But do not expect them to offer this service. And most likely, they will not issue the certificate of destruction you're used to from Europe. So as of today, we upgraded the majority of our POPs worldwide. From all the things I've told you today, what in my opinion is the most important? It's about expectations. I believe that expectations and talking about those is crucial for operating globally. How much redundancy do I need? What reaction time is acceptable to me? And how much downtime can I afford? I have told you a lot about challenges and I hope you can learn from some of the solutions that we found to our problems. While operating a global network can be challenging, it's definitely worth it, not just from an economical perspective. We gained insights into new countries, markets, and cultures. Many of us made friends. And I want to encourage you to not to hesitate when it comes to expanding your network globally. Thank you. But always remember, you cannot drive there. Yeah, Theo, many, many thanks for that great uh, talk. Um, there was a lively discussion in the chat on the main stage. And um, I want to uh, give you a, one of the questions. The first question would be, in what location or country would you think is the, are the upkeep costs like space, electricity, cross connects? So generally the lowest in your experience. So if, if I would expand, uh, like shown in your network, um, which country should I choose for the lowest upkeep costs? Mm, that, that's different. That's difficult to answer uh, because usually the, the less expensive markets are the one where you have a um, kind of a lot of offerings in terms of co-location and, and connectivity. So the lowest costs you will usually find in Europe and in, in the US. But um, if you're looking um, for places outside Europe and the US, um, Eastern Europe usually is 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 uh, it's is not very much expensive, and um, also um, some places also in Latin America. But it depends really on what you're looking for, and uh, about, about what type of service, for example, cross connect or transit we're talking. Um, yeah, but do not expect the same prices outside of Europe and the US anywhere on the world. Yeah, of course, and at the end you 
always need to evaluate your total cost of ownership with all the uh, customs, what you told about us, or the, the, the maybe the traveling if uh, um, the field service uh, on site ca cannot fix um, your, your problem. So did you actually go somewhere to fix things because um, the field service couldn't manage it by heart? Um, yes and no. So we went to many places like in Brazil, in the US, in Asia uh, by ourselves. Uh, but we also hired local engineers and local partners um, to do jobs remote hands were not able to carry out. From, from like technicians to, dorm, to translators, um, to just people um, kind of driving our hardware from one data center to another, for example. And what would be the, you know, the best location uh, for traveling if there's a fault? <laughs> I think um, the locations which were most interesting to travel to, let's uh, say it this way, were Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, of course, uh, because those markets are, have the biggest difference, are showing the biggest difference to what we know and what we're used to in Europe. Um, okay, um, so you might mind sharing some more um, slides, maybe in the social tonight or um, um, in the chats or um, on other uh, media. It was greatly discussed in the chat and I think a lot of people have interest in some more of the interesting uh, photos. Yes, so we have gathered I think more than 3000 pictures, funny pictures from all these uh, upgrades we did globally and uh, yeah, if there's a demand of course I can also do a just a just a picture show of of um, yeah, funny locations and, and interesting things we saw. Okay, that's cool. Um, all the, the taxes and the um, custom parts, is there a, um, uh, do you have a, a kind of a company, a partner who is helping you with that? Or is it all of your own responsibility and uh, your team is filling out all the custom forms on themselves? Um, so we, we call this project internally Jugendforscht. I think many of the German attendees of this, uh, this conference uh, know this term uh, because we did most of it ourselves. So we have partners assisting us in, um, in shipping and, and importing and exporting stuff. But um, even when they uh, approach us and say, guys, um, please uh, provide us document A or B, that's usually not all of it. So uh, many of these things I talked about, uh, we encountered uh, when we were the ones asking questions or we were the ones who were kind of uh, stumbling about uh, um, yeah, uh, forms and regulations we found somewhere on the internet or got insights into by people from the community. Okay. Um, yeah, well, thank you um, for all the information. Thank you for your great um, talk. Um, I think uh, I've uh, scanned through the chat and um, we have answered the questions. Um, Theo is still around, so you feel free to uh, talk to him directly um, or to find um, the chat for his uh, talk in um, the chat button list. Yeah, Theo, thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank uh, you very much for having me. All of you have a great meeting. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.